Welcome back to Medicine Deconstructed. I'm your host, Dr. Jay Rutland. I've talked a lot of interstitial lung disease, but I wanna break the topic down even further. Today, let's discuss connective tissue disease related interstitial lung disease. Let go. Connective tissue is a term given to several body tissues that connect, support, and help bind other tissues. It contributes to many body functions, including supporting organs and cells, transporting nutrients and wastes, defending against pathogens, storing fat, and repairing damaged tissues. It's composed primarily of an extracellular matrix and a limited number of cells. But most connective tissues are composed of ground substance, fibers, cells, even blood and lymph tissue which are specialized fluid connective tissues without fiber. There are over 200 connective tissue disorders, but today we're gonna to focus on autoimmune connective tissue disease. There are five defined autoimmune connective tissue diseases. Systemic lupus erythematosus, lupus, systemic sclerosis or scleroderma, myositis, which includes polymyositis and dermatomyositis, rheumatoid arthritis, and Sjogren's syndrome. But I always say disease doesn't read books. Patients may have symptoms and lab findings consistent with a systemic connective tissue disease, but do not meet the criteria, and we call them undifferentiated connective tissue disease. Sjogren's syndrome is essentially extra lymph in some of the glands, and it can lead to dry mouth and dry eye. Scleroderma is fibrotic skin, but you can also have a fibrotic esophagus or a fibrotic lung. All throughout the body, you have different areas of fibrosis. Rheumatoid arthritis tends to be autoimmune inflammation of the joints, right? Your knees, your elbows, your hands, your feet. Dermatomyositis and polymyositis, these are typically muscle inflammation and you will get rash on your skin and you'll see these types of findings. Lupus is an autoimmune disease that affects your eyes, your skin, your heart, your blood. It can affect any and all tissues. But these are the five really defined with specific criteria, autoimmune connective tissue diseases. And they're all associated with interstitial lung disease. Generally speaking, 30% of those defined as undifferentiated connective tissue disease will develop criteria and be diagnosed as a specific connective tissue disease within five years. Another term that we use commonly is mixed connective tissue disease, which means you have an autoantibody to a ribonucleoprotein and clinical features of lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, or polymyositis. Obviously, there's gonna be other overlap syndromes since immunology isn't exactly exact, but all of these conditions are associated with interstitial lung disease, that is, autoimmune inflammation of the lungs. In rheumatoid arthritis, we say 15 to 30% of individuals will have interstitial lung disease on high-resolution CT. Individuals with scleroderma, 67% of those will have findings of ILD on chest CT. The point is to look for these findings at the HRCT. Autoimmune disease can take place anywhere in the body. In this case, there are specific diseases that have radiographic features in the lung. And when we think about findings on HRCT, they follow the same patterns we described in the drug-induced lung disease episode here. Here's a quick reminder. Remember the lung is made of pipes and balloons stacked on top of one another. The types of pipes include the bronchioles, arterioles, the capillaries, the veins. The balloons are quite simply the alveoli. All of these structures are organized in what's called the secondary pulmonary lobule. Again, the Disneyland balloon man holding up all those balloons. The secondary pulmonary lobules are outlined by interstitium. We call it interlobular septa. This is connective tissue that holds the structures together. You have all of these lobules stacked on top of one another. Other words that I may use to describe CTs are subplural. This quite frankly means right next to the chest wall or along a fissure. So let's get through these patterns. Remember the patterns again, the sarcoid-like pattern, ground glass opacity pattern, linear reticular pattern, organizing pneumonia pattern, and the fibrotic pattern. When you think about the sarcoid-like pattern, what you're going to see is increased attenuation along the areas where the lymphatics travel. That's parabronchovascular, next to the bronchial and the pulmonary artery, and subpleural. You're also going to see interlobular septal thickening. Lymphatics travel there as well. 
We also have to talk about this second pattern. This is that centrilobular ground glass nodule pattern. All this means is that the ground glass nodules, which look gray, are in the center of the secondary pulmonary lobule. You can see that here. That third pattern is diffuse ground glass opacity. Remember ground glass opacity is an opacity that doesn't obscure the underlying structurals, the bronchioles, the pulmonary vessels. The next pattern is that linear pattern. This is going to follow the interlobular septa. It follows it, so you have thick interlobular septa. At times, you're going to have ground glass opacities, and at times, you're also going to have pulmonary edema. You might see a pleural effusion with this pattern. When you think about that fibrotic pattern, this is easy to identify. These patients are going to look like they have IPF or UIP, but they have that connective tissue disease. You're going to see fibrotic bronchiectasis. You're going to see honeycombing, those little black cysts right next to each other. And you might see some ground glass opacities. That last pattern is organizing pneumonia. Organizing pneumonia can be ground glass or really dense consolidation. If that dense consolidation surrounds ground glass, we call that the atoll sign. To treat CTD ILD, we're going to use medications that are indicated to treat the specific autoimmune disease. But we're also going to use medications that reduce inflammation in the lung. So a staple therapy for CTD ILD is mycophenolate mofetil. I use this every day in my practice. Other therapies are based on the immunology that I see once I perform a bronchoscopy and I look at the cells that are located in the lung. Are they a lot of B cells? I might block the B cell. But let's take a step forward. I want to introduce a new concept that we call progressive pulmonary fibrosis, or PPF. It's defined of the presence of two out of three criteria. These criteria include worsening respiratory symptoms, that's easy, worsening pulmonary function, and radiological progression in patients with interstitial lung disease. So in other words, you get a CT and you see more whiteness or more scarring or inflammation on the CAT scan. So a certain amount of individuals with any interstitial lung disease, including the autoimmune connective tissue diseases, can develop progressive pulmonary fibrosis, but we have to talk about it because there's a treatment for it. The treatment for progressive pulmonary fibrosis is natinonib or OFEV. We're going to follow pulmonary function by measuring spirometry in clinic, and we're going to see that their FVC declined by 10%, that their FEV1 declined by 10%. Are they having worsening symptoms? Are they having worsening progression on CT. This is going to qualify us for PPF. We have to understand this because we have these newer therapies that can be used to treat these individuals with devastating lung disease. CTD ILD can be seen as difficult, but it's not. We just have to recognize patterns and listen to our patients while understanding that disease doesn't necessarily read books. We'll see you next time here on Medicine Deconstructed. Subscribe, respond, make comments. I don't care what you do, but if you have questions, engage with me and I'll engage back, I promise.